Welcome to the 18% podcast. Did you know that in 2018 there was a study released which said that only 18% of people in the performing arts were working class? Ridiculous, isn't it? My name is Tom Mayhew and I'm a working class comedian and I've set up this podcast where 100% of the guests will be working class. There'll be comedians, writers, musicians, actors, there'll be all sorts of people, anyone who does something creative because these are voices and stories that you don't really hear. I feel like a lot of working class people, you're taught not to talk about it or when you try and talk about it, people tell you to stop going on about it. So I thought it'd be nice to set up a podcast where people can hear stories from people like us. Hello and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I wasn't hosting it last week because I was unwell, I was like Tiny Tim as my producer said. Some people thought I wasn't going to make it to Christmas but I'm still here so who knows what's happening. Today's episode is with writer and actor and all round amazing person, Ambreen Razia. Her work's so well constructed and put together, it's, it's fantastic. Hamster Diaries, which is the pilot episode of a sitcom she has written, and she acts in as well, that was on BBC One a few days ago. So it's a proper telly star, but in a podcast. Ambreen Razi, are you right? Yeah, you're right. I'm good, thank you. You've you've had a busy few days. I have. Your um, <laughs> the, the pilot for your your sitcom. Um, I keep going to say Diary of a Hounslow Girl because yeah. I get it mixed up with the play. Yeah. But it's not. It's called Hounslow Diaries. That's right. Yeah. I wasn't sure whether the change was because Diary of a Hounslow Girl was just one person that you playing mm. all the characters, yeah. whereas this had. It was almost like you went, right, I'm going to take those characters and have different mm. people playing them. I wasn't yeah. sure if that was yeah. diary to diary. Do you or... know what? I never thought of that. But actually, that sounds maybe subconsciously because it became about you're three su- girls yeah. instead of one, actually. You're a subconscious genius. Yeah. Well, <laughs> never wouldn't describe myself as that, but if you want to, that's... I will. Yeah, I, I put it on record. <laughs> it's, um, it's going out there. Um, yeah, so I think it, it probably, maybe because it's about three girls and it's more sort of about everyone as opposed to just her yeah i guess you know in the play version it's quite personal and um it's an insight just into her life and she's kind of yeah like you said playing everyone but yeah hounslow diaries just there's a lot about like the place hounslow as well and i think because that is such a pivotal part of the pilot it's kind of you know like i think that that was the word that we really wanted to highlight for the title it's recently gone out on BBC Three, and that was the first sort of twenty-minute episode. Yeah, and it's really good. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, but what is you? You were saying that the reaction has sort of it's produced like different emotions. Like, has it has it all been good, or have you got some shit from it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think when you release anything on like a a big scale where it's accessible to basically the whole nation, if you like, you are going to get you know you're not going to be able to filter out everything but I would say like you know 95% of it has been really really positive but you do get the odd I mean it's it is slightly controversial in its own way um so I guess you are going to get you know some people just kind of trickling in and saying um I don't know that they don't agree with something or it's not to their taste um and I guess you're accessible to it if you're on social media so for those who've not seen it i mean it'll probably still be an eye player when this mm-hmm. goes out mm-hmm. and the basic concept is that it's three teenage muslim girls yeah. who live in hounslow yeah. and it's sort of their adolescence yeah. their coming of age i think you've used the phrase that then balancing the two worlds of like the mm-hmm. uh, traditional or muslim upbringing mm-hmm. with the the western civilization you know yeah. it's kind of them trying to balance those two as yeah that's right you know there are going to be um some people who are within the community or who are within any kind of Muslim community who don't necessarily agree with it. Um, And that's fine if they don't. Um, Yeah, I mean, that would always be the way, whatever you do. That's whatever you do. If it was majorly traditional, there'd be people who are more like you who'd be like, well, that's that's not me, and you'd get annoyed with that. Exactly. So you're not going to be able to please everyone, I guess. But I think I 
I guess it's completely based on my school days and observations that I've made and none of it's made up so if it's the truth then you can't really kind of deny it or like be angry at it because it ha it does happen and it has happened um, it's not just a fictional world I've made up this this is you know predominantly from my school school days and people that I I grew up with so yeah and you, so you were raised Muslim? Yes, I'm still Muslim. Still Muslim, that's yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah. Just quite clear. That was going to be my second question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it would have been, if you weren't Muslim now, it would have been a weird thing to write about, I suppose. I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess it, yeah. I guess not only is it's because I'm Muslim myself, but I predominantly work with young Muslim girls as well. I teach and I facilitate. Um, I still do that and I... Um, you know, teach young Muslim girls between the ages of 12 to 16. So I'm kind of always around them, even now, like that youth, um, that voice, those voices, I'm always, always in the middle of it. So I'm always kind of picking up stuff. And then I think, I suppose me being Muslim as well, there is like a deep rooted passion to want to tell that story. And I think, you, I think, well, I mean, based on uh, the pilot, mm -hmm. I think you, you tell it really, really well. I think what's, what's so Thank good you. about it is that it does it shows real Muslim young people. Mm. You could easily get someone like a BBC Free Commissioner who goes, oh, we want to do a, a sitcom about Muslim girls who are too conservative and they're all freaked out by sex and drugs and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's good to just be like, no, this is them and this is their real life. This is how, yeah. how people are. Like yeah. I, I used to work with a, a guy called Abnan and he was, you know, raised uh, Muslim. He yeah. observed Ramadan and stuff like that. He was sort of a strict Muslim. Like he didn't mm -hmm. do drugs or drink or anything. Yeah. But then because he had the Western culture, he sort of would walk around going, weed is my best friend. <laughs> just because just he liked hip hop. And yeah. it was like, that's that's just the, the merging of the two cultures. And, yeah. and that's what real Muslim people are like. They, yeah, yeah, they're yeah. not these weird caricature sort of stereotypes who all they do is pray and yeah. not eat pork which is all pe some people sort of know really I guess it's because it's and that's the thing it's like until you unless you know people like that personally um, which you probably would do in London if you mm. go to school in London or growing up in London but if you live outside of London and you don't predominantly you know know people like that who do merge the two kind of cultures together or you just haven't really met many Muslims because you've lived outside of London or you've lived in a slightly rural area or something. Um, so I guess it's like, it's not something that you know or you'll ever know or you're familiar with. It's like when I toured Diary of a Hounslow Girl to places like Dorset, the response to that would be so much different to when I went to Birmingham because it was just like a window into a new world for them and a new character who they'd never seen walking down there would say street but seaside town <laughs> like, do you know like so I guess it's kind of um yeah I guess it it is a bit of a shock maybe a bit of a culture shock for some people who aren't from London or from in it or from cities because it is a, a very city play if you like yeah and I think also I think like how 30 years ago like the idea of someone who was Christian having sex outside of marriage or having an abortion or something or being gay would sort of, it would have been far more controversial. Mm. But as society becomes more sort of, well, as it grows and sort of Christianity has been around for a long more, that sort of progressed more in our society. Yeah. And I sort of think at a moment, regard, people's regards to Muslim culture is they sort of, they know the basics, they sort of know that women wear a hijab and you have Ramadan, but that's all they know. And they've not yet got that more in-depth knowledge that would only come with, you know, time and, and more and more representation like your TV show. You know, not all Muslim girls wear the hijab all the time, just like not all Christian men are married to women, yeah. so, you know, and it's kind of, I feel like it's... I think I think Muslim girls, if they decide to wear the hijab, yeah. then they'll wear it yeah. all the time because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a choice that they've made, but they'll wear it in whichever way they want to wear it. Mm -hmm. So that's like, um, you know, if you, if you notice now, like it's not... Even in, for example, even in the pilot, you've got Tash who wears it in a very different way to Leone. Leone wears it in a very traditional way and Tash is kind of still covering her hair, but she's got her own style and changes it up every day because it becomes a, a, um, a way of identifying as well. with the, Like it's, it becomes a kind of fashion trend, I guess, mm. as well, as well as kind of, it's like me blow drying my hair and tonging and curling it. I feel like with the hijab, it's kind of the same thing. It's like styling it 
to how you kind of want it but still covering your hair so I think it's a choice that you make religiously but then there's ways of identifying yourself with it I think it kind of sort of epitomizes what the idea of you know the house of girls seems to be about it's about representing there's something really striking about the idea of them being the Muslim women who are sort of wearing the hijab to cover their modesty but then they've still got the big hoop ear or earrings mm-hmm. and the makeup so mm-hmm. it's still them having that element of western culture yeah and it, it, it's really I think one that I really liked from the pilot is the bit before they go into um, uh, the club mm. and there's the two of the girls who don't have the hijab on yeah uh, and then they say to the third one um I don't remember names. I'm so sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I didn't mean that that's to be fine. rude. That's Leone. fine. But... Leone's the uh, third, the third one. <laughs> okay, they say yeah. to Leone, yeah. um, you know, oh, come on, mate. You can, you know, you can take it off, take it yeah. off for one night, and she's like, no, I'd, yeah. I'd rather keep it on. But that's sort of like a really nice moment because yeah. it sort of, firstly, it epitomizes you know the essence of community and their their mutual understanding, mm. understanding and respect. Mm. But it also shows how it, it's not like most media who would put Muslim women in a box and that's mm. what they're all like it's mm. this one scene that goes that this is what they're like and this is how, how they can be different yeah. this is diversity within this diverse group mm. and that's I think that's really really important and yeah. a really awesome thing thank you yeah no I also think like because Tash she chooses to take her hers off Shahida doesn't wear one but then Leone keeps it on and doesn't want to take it off but I think you've got to you've got to make it like I went like in school I knew girls in school who would still go out with it on, but just make it look really funky and really like it used to be kind of the style then was more like a bandana. Hmm. Um, so I guess it's kind of you don't want them all to just take off their hijabs, do you know, and then just run into the club because it's yeah. just like, what is that saying? It's not real either. Like you know, young Muslim girls do go out with their hijab. Why? Why not? You know. So I think it was like kind of just in that scene, like differentiating all three characters um and yeah i mean i'll probably will get some backlash for tash taking hers off but that is the reality for some muslim girls as well because when i went to school you know come 3 30 there were girls in the toilets who were taking their hijab off and going to meet their boyfriends and that's the reality of it and then putting it back on before they went home so it's about showing all aspects and all the voices of young muslim girls as opposed to just one why have three characters if you've got one voice You don't wear the hijab. I don't. <laughs> and have you never worn it? No, I've never worn it. I've read you were raised and you were sort of taught it was a choice and you just went, you just chose not to. Is that right? Do you know what? It's funny, like, I I wouldn't completely shut myself off to it in the sense where in the future I don't know whether I would choose to wear it or not. Um, I definitely, there's times where I've definitely felt a lot closer to my religion. Um, my nan passed away this year. In, in Islam, we do something called the ghusl. Basically, you wash the body and you um, shroud the body before it's buried. And I suppose, because I did that for my grandmother, because it's the closest woman to the woman who's passed away. Or the yeah. thing. So having done that, um, I immediately after that, I felt much closer to Islam. I can't explain what it was, but it was just something... Um, it was that particular thing that we did together the ghuzzle washing our body, burying her like it just felt very spiritual and I did feel closer to it and I remember having a conversation with my sister and saying I wouldn't be I would never ever completely reject the idea of wearing a hijab it's just at this precise moment in time I choose not to uh, Am I right in saying it was it your, your uh, grandmother who did she help raise you? Yeah, I mean, she was a huge part of my upbringing. From, like, the age of 18, I lived with her um, till she passed away this this year. Wow. Um, So, you know, I was so fortunate that the BBC dedicated the pilot to her. That's a really lovely thing as well. At the very end, yeah. And I, I just simply felt really strongly about it because if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have... I just don't think I would have had the space the room that I was in, like, the, the, a, a place to write the pilot. So I just felt like it should have been. And she was so, even though she didn't speak a word of English, she was always so encouraging, like, was a bit, 
was you know like a mother figure to me so I guess it was kind of yeah it was like she really inspired me every day and also gave me a roof over my head to write the pilot you know I just thought it would be amazing if I could dedicate this to her because if it wasn't for her I probably would have had to work three four jobs at the time um to like cover rent and cover like I'm still paying rent but like covering like costs and rent and stuff and then also and this probably wouldn't have got written for another two years because of because life gets in the way so I was really fortunate what was your um, upbringing like before then so I come from a single parent family um and I guess I've just like always grown up in a working class family like me and my mum um single yeah she's a single mum and then I guess she kind of I moved in with my nan, she needed like, you know, someone there to look after her. Mm. So between like me and my kind of cousins, we did, but I was, I I lived with her. So I had a really strong connection with her. Um, But we all, yeah, like my nan, you know, she came from Pakistan during the partition and settled here and just worked, 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 worked. And I think I just come from like a family of just hardworking people. Um, and a family of just no men and just pure lioness women, just pure strength. And I, I guess that's where my passion for writing strong female characters comes from as well, because I never grew up with women who were victims or, or saw themselves as victims. Mm. Maybe they would be seen as victims in terms of the way their husbands treated them, or you know, but in terms of the way they saw themselves they never saw themselves as passive or victims they just got on with it and that's always how I wanted to kind of write the women in my story I think um that's you know another thing that is re- really really good about um uh Hounslow and Diaries because they are kind of like an overused term like strong independent women but but that's kind of what they are you know yeah. they're, they're strong they're doing stuff on their own they're sort of you know that they have their own sort of independence and they sort of beg steal and borrow for in the first episode but they have their own you know independence you know they fight for what they want Mm. and it's really good to sort of have that especially when i feel like the sort of perception in a lot of the media is that muslim women are are weak and it's you know oh it's it's men who are strong and they're just really weak behind them because yeah partly because of the culture of some Muslim countries and parties mm. because that's that's all that ever gets shown. Yeah, even on, I mean, even t- television wise, I feel like sometimes there's there's really not enough Asian comedy, particularly for women. I don't feel, um, not to put this in an Asian comedy bracket or anything, but in terms of representing those voices, I just don't think that there's enough of that. So predominantly, the way that um, Muslim women are shown is through in in drama narratives. And quite often they are victims or they're passive or they're extremists. It's mm. like, you know, so I think it's really important to have something like a Hounslow Diaries to just, I guess, balance it out really and kind of go, okay, you've got that side of things. And we understand there's a lot of sinister, sinister stuff going on. But then you've got just kids trying to come of age as well. And yeah. it's really funny. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's a laugh. So it's like we, we do need that, you know, we need a balance. You say a lot of it's um, inspired by your your upbringing. Um, and I, I read somewhere that it said when you were uh, 16, you fell in love with a, a non-Muslim person. Yeah, I mean, I've heard... I mean, and yeah. you, had, you had to hide it from your family. Yeah, I mean, when I was 16, I had a boyfriend hmm. who um, wasn't Muslim, just like a lot of girls do. I mean, I think, I guess, my family wasn't the type who would do anything extreme in any way but there was still a level of feeling that it was very it was wrong to have a book and not just even a non-muslim but just a boyfriend at that age yeah because a lot of you know within islam you know women are supposed to get married first before having sex or before doing anything like that so i think it was like quite it's quite scary to have to kind of tell people who believe in this kind of system if you like about you know a boy or something like that so yeah I mean I guess you do hide it I did hide it for a long time and even when I did tell my mum she was a bit like she was like okay but deep down I knew that she wasn't completely comfortable with it at all how long did you hide it for I 
think about a good year and a half. Wow. Yeah. And then did you, did you, like, did she? She knew. Was, was he, like, coming round and, and she, had she met him and stuff? Yeah, I think she, she'd met him because he, he went to my school years ago, so she knew of him. But then, and then, yeah, I mean, I guess he only started coming round once I told her, but we would just meet out. You know, and that's the thing is though is that he was a non-Muslim boy, and I guess like you know a lot of the young girls that I teach and stuff, you know, some of them come up to me and say I have a boyfriend who is Muslim, but I still can't tell my parents. So I just I don't think it's actually a Muslim thing, whether it's a Muslim boy or not a Muslim boy. I think it's the fact that it's a boy at that age, and the generation above us are very protective of their daughters. I don't know because it's just. So I think there is this kind of fear around that. Well, that's why that's why the type of representation that you are putting on telly is is so important mm. because it's it's normalising it and it's it's showing to these young girls and young men mm. that it, it's all right to have these feelings and to be attracted to people. Yeah. And you know to to be a normal teenager and it, it's uh, I think your show sort of shows them that yeah it's all right you can you can do that it's fine whereas. Mm. Some of them, the whole upbringing would go, no, you can't do that. Mm. But you're sort of going, no, there is there is another way. You can do this, that's fine. Yeah, of course. And also in the, in the pilot, I mean, they're not even concerned about boys at this stage. They're just concerned mm. about having a night out. I mean, I guess, you know, fingers crossed, if it goes to series, maybe we could explore one of them having a, a love interest or something. Because I think that's so important because it does happen. But I think, like, you know, the majority of the time, it is just about the solidarity between these three girls and what they find in each other is a bit like Dairy Girls on Channel 4 in the sense where I'm sure one of them will have a boyfriend at some point, but it's like, oh, fuck that, you know, it's about us, really. Um, so I guess it's kind of, that always comes second, and the friendship always comes first. And I guess, yeah, I guess it was always like that at school with me, like the girls came first all the time. Oh, lovely. <laughs> well done, that's the right choice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think so. So um, when you, you um, your mum's a single mum. Yeah. Do you want to talk about why your dad's not around? Are you, are you happy to talk about on this? Or? Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, there's nothing really to it. I guess he just, he just was not really set up to be a dad. And he was a bit impressionable. And not, couldn't keep up with her strength. And I'll be totally honest, I think that's what it was. I just don't think he had it in him to be on a kind of partnership level with her in the sense I just think that he was a bit lost and a bit impressionable and a little bit weak and she was so strong so I guess she kind of made a decision that either you have someone like that in and out of your life and you remain confused until your adult life or you just completely take them out of which you know we chose to do she chose to do is to take him out of my life and then not have so much inconsistency back and forth and I'm glad she did that I thank her for that even now but yeah that's it really and was it always um, just you and your mum then? yeah so me and my so I have an older sister as well who I live with now me and her live together um, who is like my best friend and my soulmate and um, yeah I guess she moved she went to university and she moved out but we we became like I think we're just so close we've always been really close we are 12 years apart so she did have a huge part in raising me and I guess I suppose that's where this kind of connection comes from but now it's great because we're both at a certain age where like we can just be really good mates um and I guess we've just seen a lot with each other and supported each other through so much I guess maybe that's what trickles out from Hounslow Diaries is mine and my sister's relationship and how close we are and how close women and girls can be together. Muslim girls. So was she from the same father? No, we okay. are different dads. We are two different dads. So For a second I was a bit confused. No, sorry, like, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, we have two. We're, we're, so we're actually half sisters, but we've never... But you're basically sisters. We're basically yeah. sisters. We've never, ever kind of seen the half in anything. We are like best mates and sisters and everything. Yeah. And do you think not having your dad around, that your sister may have taken on some sort of parental role almost in yeah. raising you do you know what now you say it i mean to be fair you, you could have had a strong mum and a weak dad mm. but instead with your mum 
your grandmother and your sister. You've got three strong women, and that's much better. Oh yeah, when, you've hit oh, the jackpot gosh. there. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think I think I was really fortunate to have my grandmother for so many years, who taught me things that my mum couldn't teach me, and then my sister, who couldn't teach me things that my that either of them could teach me, so that I learned something different from all three of them. Um, I was so fortunate to have three of them. But like, for example, when I wanted to go into acting, it was my sister who had my back with that. Even though my mum is super westernised, you know, she was more worried about the security of it, being an actress. Because I think when my grandmother and people of that generation settled into this country, the main aim for them, the main goal for them was to find a sense of security in anything, whether that be through property, um, marriage, a- any kind of form of like, is it a convention or system or like kind of security within that, mm. I guess. And um, yeah, I guess uh, when I said I wanted to be an actress, they were like, my mum and my nan were like, are you sure you want to be an actress? And it is hard financially to be an actress. Yeah, well, I think maybe that attitude could also come from the fact that if if they didn't have much money, yeah, they're, they're worried that you'll be the same. Cause yeah, like my parents are similar. When when I first started doing comedy, and even now they're sort of always like, whenever I achieve anything, the first thing my dad will say is, "Oh, did you get paid?" Mm. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's it's like, oh, I'm going to perform stand up on the radio. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm really excited. He's like, "Oh, you're going to get paid," and it's like it always boils down yeah. to that. But that's because yeah. for them, they. And I, I you remember know, my nan asked me once. She was like, "How much did you get paid?" And I was like, "That's really rude." Yeah. Like, don't ask me how much I get paid. Especially when at the start it's usually nothing. <laughs> so you're just yeah, like... yeah, you're kind of like. But then I felt really bad after saying that because actually it was like I realised that it was a place of like worry for me in mm. terms of like, are you getting paid for your work? But it was always like, how much are you getting paid? When are you getting paid? Mm. Are you going to be on the TV so we can show the whole family? Oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess it's kind of. Um, well, now your nan's name's on TV. I lo- know. That's lovely. And I took on her her first name as my last name. I got rid of my dad's name. Um, so Ambreen, so her first name was Razia. So my, I changed my stage name to Ambreen Razia. And I feel like since I did that, I just have had, my career has just gone from strength to strength. And you did that when she was still around? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Really yeah. Nice. I did that, yeah. How did she react? She like, oh my gosh, she was so happy. Every time, like, something would come up on the telly and her name would be there. Or like when I first took home my play text of Diary of a Hounslow Girl and she was like, she was like, oh my gosh, she was like, I'm famous. I was like, kind of, yeah. <laughs> of course she is. Oh, yeah. she, she is now. Yeah, she is now. She's on the BBC. Yeah. She'd love that. Um, so how, how do you think she would react if, if she knew? She'd be overjoyed. She was always really overjoyed at, at stuff like that. Um, yeah, she'd, she'd be so happy. Because obviously when she came to this country, you know, the BBC, the, the word BBC, because all of the queens, I think her coronation was on the BBC. Mm-hmm. And for her, that's she loved the queen. For a Muslim woman who lived in Pakistan, who, I guess, you know, with Britain, who basically came and parted the country, mm. I've just I've not known someone to just love the queen so much, a Muslim <laughs> woman. And I was like... I don't understand why I love. She was like, I just love seeing what she wears, and I just think the kids are so cute. And and I'm just like, why do you love the queen? I was just like, people who are British don't even love the queen as much as you do. And she was yeah. like, I just love the queen. Um, and I guess it was like, so you know, when I told her first that I was going to be on the BBC, she was like, the BBC. Like it felt felt like a massive thing because, you know, that's when she came and she saw the queen's coronation and she saw all the marriages on the you know, the royal family on the BBC and she always kind of, I guess she kind of associated that with a sense of like arist- aristocracy in a way, like it was, yeah, it was odd. Um, so she'd be thrilled. Oh, lovely. Yeah, she'd be thrilled. She's a celebrity and everyone's... She is a celebrity. There we yeah. go. I was really, I was, yeah, I was really, really happy when I did that. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. When you first got into doing Diary of a Hounslow Girl, how did you get into theatre? Were you into theatre growing up? Yeah, I love theatre. I I love theatre from, like, college. That's when I started to really love theatre because that's when I started to read plays and fall in love with plays. Um, before, before college, it was films. But I guess, yeah, I guess I kind of... Well, then I went to college and then university. 
and then my love for theatre grew even more and that's when I got to see lots of theatre as well but I read some amazing plays which really inspired me and you'd like to recommend or I think I guess like Joe Walton was a huge um a, a playwright who I was just super passionate about I remember reading a play called Yard Girl by Rebecca Pritchard about two girls from a gang um growing up in Hackney and I remember seeing that and just going gosh like wow there's these there's there's a space for these voices in theatre as well it's not just Shakespeare and you know um restoration and then I guess um I guess like you know all the working class stuff I gravitate towards a lot Jim Cartwright Jonathan Harvey David Eldridge so yeah I mean I guess I fell in love with with plays and East Disease stuff that's that was a huge thing for me when I saw East Disease East because I was like wow there is the, the play or the film the film and then I read the play and I was like wow there is actually um, a space for Pakistani actors and it was just amazing I suppose that could be part of the reason why when you first got into acting family may have been a bit hesitant to encourage you because I mean, even even now there's it's getting a lot better but there's yeah. there's not much representation so no. it's for them they might be like you can either have that one role on EastEnders or you're not on telly or whatever you know yeah. it's that was always a question are you going to be on EastEnders are you going to be in Coronation Street is that just because they've had some it's because they that's what they know as yeah. the biggest telly thing is yeah. soaps it's Are such you? a big tradition for this. No, I'm not. Oh, um, but it's such a... some breaking news there. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not. Um, Are you running the Queen Vic? That would no, have been great. Yeah, that would have been great. That would that would be progress, yeah. me running the Queen Vic. Let's start the petition now. Yeah, exactly. Um, God, can you imagine a Muslim bartender behind the Queen Vic? I mean... <laughs> I'd love that. I would love that. Actually, that's great. Should we invest to BBC? Yeah. Like, this is what you should do. Yeah. And then um, they know who you are now, so... Yeah. I think, you know what, maybe I'd consider EastEnders if I got that role. <laughs> but other than that, I'll just keep it quiet. Yeah, yeah, anything else but that, no, but... Yeah. Queen Vic bartender, yes. Anything else, no. no? Yeah, basically. You don't want to run Ian's Chippy at all? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Don't blame me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but other than, like, other than that, like, it was, yeah, it was like, are you going to be on EastEnders? Are you going to be on Coronation Street? But yeah, I get what you mean. You know, there wasn't any voices... There wasn't any people of colour on, on screen. I mean, you did have... I guess you had, like, some comedy, like... Uh, in the 70s, they had that show, um, Love Thy Neighbour, which now is just horrific, in the sense, if you watch it now, it's just, like, super racist, and you're like... <gasps> oh, wasn't that also Goodness Gracious Me and Goodness stuff Gracious like that? Me is amazing, and, you know, Goodness Gracious Me, like, was, again, something I watched in university and went, this is possible. But it was just one show, really, at the time. But they really, like... The Goodness Gracious Me was just such a breakthrough, I think, for this country, comedy-wise, for British Asian comedy, because it was just brilliant. Hilarious. I mean, you're now a sitcom writer. So do you, do you feel you're, you're moving moving into comedy? Is that what you think? I mean, I would you, guess, Would you do stand-up? Would you do anything like that? I mean, I, having done a one-woman show, like, it's not something that I... I think I could do it and I think if I worked on it I could but I just I'll be honest it terrifies me to be on stage as myself like I'd have to hide behind the character um and again like with with the pilot like hiding behind Shahida like I think at heart I'm an actress I think doing stand-up is so brave and but I just think I'm personally not brave enough to do to do that do you think stand-up comedians are the bravest people in the world? I think they're one of the bravest people in the world, yeah. Just... Thank you. Got that on record. <laughs> there we go. Are you a stand-up? I am, yes. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It is. It's really... I can't imagine... Like, it is super hard. We did, like, a court, um, uh, period of it at university where we did stand-up and I was like, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever had to do. I don't think it's too different to acting, though. You just... Um... Because all stand-ups have their own persona. Yeah. So you basically are playing a role. Yeah, I guess like, so. Like, you know, Milton Jones doesn't tell one-liners all day. Yeah. He sits down and eats his Cheerios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess it's just whatever you... But I, yeah, for me, it's just... Not that much want to push you into stand-up. There's yeah. Al- there's already enough of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, stay away. We don't want to... 
from Bard. Found out. Yeah, no, it was Considering just... how good you are at everything you do already, you'd be <laughs> far better than anyone else. So you're not allowed in yet. Yeah, not allowed. <laughs> um, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, I think stand-up's great. I just think um, I love, I, I really love narrative and mm. I love stories. Um, and I think my heart always tells me to want to, like, always draws me to a story and to, to write it, like, um, and characters within that story and how they kind of um, deal with, like, Especially like the Hounslow Diaries, there it's like three girls dealing with a vulgar world that's around them, and I guess it's kind of I'm just really really pushed to to write narratives at the moment. A couple of weeks ago, I saw your play. Is it called Pot or P O T? Yeah, Pot. Yeah. It's just called Pot. Yeah. But it's all in capitals, so I, yeah. didn't, I didn't know if that was some sort of. Um, no. That it doesn't just stand for it anything. <laughs> yeah, no, just Pot. Just, yeah. Why is it called Pot? It's called Pot because because um, it's about gangs and and children in care, and it's about I guess people living in their own pots of society, society like gangs and making up their own rules and belief systems. I just don't know, when I started writing it, I just visualised a cooker and, like, um, you know, it's broken up into four sections. That's a good start for any play. Yeah, exactly. I was just looking at the cooker and I was just yeah. like... And it was, there was a pot on it and I was just like, gosh, that's so separate from the rest of... Every, and it just kind of... I guess it's kind of people... It's kind of... And then I think, obviously, and then putting a lid on that situation and it just bubbling and I just had this kind of image of... It's quite lucky that you didn't call it someone like boiled potatoes or something, No, really. it was, yeah, it was really lucky, actually, yeah. that I didn't actually just kind of just take the cooker and go, actually, it should be called that. Yeah, no. Yeah. It should be called Hot Point Oven. <laughs> hot Point Oven, yeah. yeah. There's something in Hot Point Oven. I'd go see it. Yeah, no, I think it... I, I, do you know what, actually? That probably would bring a lot of people in. <laughs> I think it was so funny. I had people coming up to me going... So is it called pot because there's a lot of weed in it? And I was just like, no. But also, it was really that. It was people making up their own belief systems um, in segregated community. Like, you've got, for example, you've got a place like London. And in London, you've got the underbelly of London, where you do have gangs and you do have people who... You've got, you know, a, such a, a substantial amount of poverty that we don't really touch because of the, you know... The world we're from so i guess it's kind of yeah i guess it kind of comes from that really one of the things i really loved about pot is that it shows gang members but not in just a black and white good evil way yeah. they're sort of they're more they're deeper than that there's mm. more to them like even the worst character in pot yeah at one point you're like god he's a fucking arsehole yeah but then at another point they're on you're like oh no he's just a victim of the system he's been in he's, yeah. he's just fucked up he's just you yeah. know and you feel that sympathy which I feel like with a lot of um, media coverage of, of gangs mm. it's just like oh they're all senseless violent folks mm. but that's why I think it was re- it's really important to have that play out there actually goes no they're not all like that they just are people with problems like mm. everyone and they're people who have joined a gang because it's it felt like the only option for them yeah. you know they have, they have no money they often might not have the support of family and mm-hmm. there's one bit in the play where um louisa she, she says how she basically joined a gang because someone bought her some new shoes yeah and it's kind of like yeah if, if you if you're poor it's probably what you would do you yeah. know i I'm, I'm lucky that i grew up in um a nice small town yeah but if i lived in london and yeah. if when i was 14 someone was like here's 500 quid there's probably very little i wouldn't do for that yeah. because I'd be like, shit, that money can really help my family. Well, exactly. And that's how people get involved in gangs, because it's that simple, you know. Yeah. You, you... Also, I think it's... A gang is a family, at the end of the day. Yeah. Like how effed up it is. But there is a sense of loyalty and love within a gang. Like, and I think... And that's why people who don't have that at home are maybe attracted yeah, towards it, do you think? A hundred percent. Like, I think we all want to belong somewhere, uh, instinctually. Especially when you're young, like the young people I work with, they always want to feel like they're a part of something, um, which kind of at the, um, at the basis of it is love and, and and security. And I guess a gang does offer you that, being part of a gang. Initiations and things like that are horrific, but I suppose 
to get past that and then you're part of a family I think and that's what a lot of ex-gang members have told me that actually <clears throat> the majority of them who come from the care system want to you know I mean they're not really left with much option also Louisa in the place she goes from a number of foster homes which quite sinister stuff happens in not to say all foster homes are like that but there are some that she just hasn't fit in you know with and she just got scooped up by Josh at a time where she was incredibly vulnerable and living in a hostel so it's like you know I guess it's people who have really unfair beginnings and starts um you know, you are more likely to gravitate towards something like that. And it is a shame. It is sad. Were you ever drawn to anything like that growing up? Or was that like a different world? Well, do you know what? I guess, you know, I lived on an estate and these things happen all the time. I was never, you know, offered to do anything. Like, you know, if someone said to me, I'll deliver this and I'll give you 300 quid. At the time, when I was in school or when I was in college, I can't say whether that I would have said no if someone had offered me, because it's a lot of money, mm. and it's a month in your electric key, and, you know, it's enough to help your mum out, and I, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess I was, maybe I wasn't presented with an opportunity, you know, maybe you could say that, but then I also think, you know, there was part of me that I do have sense, like I wouldn't have you know necessarily done that and I did have very very strong women around me who would have gone what are you doing mm. um but I feel like that world was always quite accessible to like it was around me in a way but I worked with young ex-gang members for a long time so I heard a lot of stories you mm. did um you, did you sort of do drama stuff with them is that right yeah I did um so I worked at art theatre um and we ran a project called Raised Voices um, which was for young women between the ages of 12 to 16. So I worked with all kinds of women. Um, we tackled issues like domestic violence, girls in gangs, just issues that affect young women between that age, you know, FGM, um, body image, consent. And I guess we just broke those issues apart and, and, and stuff. But then I think that because we did the girls in gang stuff, I was able to talk to ex-gang members. Yeah. And Neville Lawrence, Stephen Lawrence's dad, was our patron for Arc Theatre. So when we used to go to prisons and pupil referral units and schools, sometimes he'd come with us and tell us, tell the young people about what happened to his son. And you could hear a pin drop in the room when he would talk because it was just so heartbreaking. You know. Has he seen Pop? He hasn't, and I wish he had, but I'm going to send him a play text because I guess Miles' character in that is based on Stephen yeah. Lawrence and Damalola Taylor and Shakira's Townsend, and just all of those young people that are inadvertently affected by gang culture as well. Because I think if you were to just have a play of two people in a gang, it would feel quite relentless. You've got to have that third voice who is who's so familiar with that world, but who's not directly in it. And I think it's really important to have all of that. And I think that's what helps... Um, um... I mean, spoilers if you've not seen the play or, or read the play, but yeah. you know, go on, there, go, yeah, there's, fine. You know, there, there is this this character who's um, there's a character who's not involved in a gang culture, and basically he is there as uh, a very sad victim of gang gang culture. He's a crucial representative for people who are watching it because they're like, if they can't relate to the gang culture, mm. they can at least relate to, oh shit, that could be any of us. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you're from, what you do. Mm. You could just be in the wrong place at the wrong time and you are yeah. part of that culture and a victim of it. Yeah. And so it makes it hit harder. It makes you go, oh God, that, yeah, that could be me tomorrow night. It could be anyone. It could it? be. I think, you know, in terms of where he lives, you know, you do get these really kind of abandoned estates. Mm. I'm talking about government abandoned. Like they just left it to rot. And Grenfell's a perfect example of that. Um, where these things happen and these people have to live in the most shittiest of 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 circumstances and and really because you know there's just no one pumping any funding into it or money into it um the very end of the play you know there's a clip of Theresa May talking about making a promise saying that um we need to provide viable pathways out 
the people who joined gangs. And that was in 2011 when she was Home Secretary and the rates of knife crime and gangs have gone through the roof. So it's like she hasn't done anything, basically. Not surprised. Yeah. Really, you know, it's... yeah, exactly. But it's these kind of cuts being made, you know, and, and, and money not being put in the right places and, you know, which makes really tragic things happen. But I think it's important to, that's the beauty of writing a play or a film or a piece of work is that suddenly you get an insight into people's lives. It's not just the news we see. We see an emotional arc and an emotional journey and we see characters and I guess, yeah, it's much more relatable. I think what could help knife crime, especially amongst young people, would be if we had um, part on the syllabus, maybe. That would be, honestly, I would, that's for me, I write it, I mean... <laughs> I, I, don't get me wrong, like, of course, like, it would be great if it went out to a theatre in the West End. I mean, that's great. But for me, I wrote it for those people. I wrote it for young people. And I did have schools saying, can you bring it here? And I'm like, no, can you bring your kids here? Because they should be in the front row and they should have a ticket and they should be able to come and see it in all its glory and the sense of the lighting, the sound, they should be able to have a full experience of it. Mm. And if you come, I'll give you a discount or I'll, I won't even charge you, but just bring them to the theatre. They need to be part of this theatre world that feels so aristocratic and so for the middle class. It's like, we need to break down that wall. You know, and plays like yeah. Pop need to invite those audiences in. I did have, you know, ex-care leavers ex-gang members, ex-prisoners come and see it, and those were the best nights for me. I uh, shed a few tears at the end of Pot, just because it's... I, I was someone who... I, I've never liked theatre. My, my family never really had money, so we never went to see any theatre. Yeah. I've always felt it. it is that elitist thing where I feel like, oh, it's not for me, it's yeah. for other people. Yeah. But then I sort of I got emotional at the end of Pot, because it was like, finally it's... People like like me, people like us, like my family, mm. shown there, and we're not just shown as as a scum or as lazy mm. or as victims. We're shown as fully rounded humans mm. who, yes, have problems but have hearts and souls. Yeah, and that's what I think so fucking amazing about mm. it. Thank you so much. And about everything you've done, it's incredible. Thank you. I really, it's, I really appreciate anyone who who shows any kind of support. For me, I just I started Diary of a Hamburger Girl, and I thought this would be great if it was on top of a pub. And that was it. And now it's here and I just... You're taking over the world. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it's on telly. Like, I turn on iPlayer and I'm like, what? Um, so, yeah, it's gone further than I ever thought it would. So, it's great. I watched one thing on YouTube. That was you at somewhere called Monologue Slam. Yeah, oh God. I think it's from years <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, years ago. Um, probably before Hounslow Girl. Yeah. You know, it's from ages ago. <laughs> yeah. But I just thought um, even that was really interesting because in it you're playing a, a Muslim girl wearing a hijab who talks about fancying people of both genders. Yeah. And it, it just feels like you're on this one woman crash course of breaking down stereotypes yeah, 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 yeah. and standing up for the disenfranchised yeah. and people who aren't represented and that's yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. I'm working I mean she I remember that character, she was super working class as well. And yeah, just fancied both sexes and she was really. It, we had a minute basically to just. Um, we had a minute to just smash it out of the park. So I was just like, right, let me just get everything in there, as grotesque as, as it might seem to some people. But yeah, let's just yeah, let's just do it. But yeah, no, it was. Um, I guess yeah, slowly taking over the world, maybe. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Got, got my vote as prime minister. Great. Okay. Great. That's great. I will run for prime minister. Oh. You promise? Yeah, yeah. it's on the podcast. I can't take it back. <laughs> okay, great. I'm not, I'm not like Theresa May. I don't... Yeah. <laughs> don't lie. <laughs> no, no. Well, this has been lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do you want people just to follow you on Twitter and stuff like that and Facebook? Is it all just your name? And... Yeah, just um, at Ambreen Razia. And it's the same on Instagram, Ambreen Razia. Facebook. Ha- Hounds Own Diaries on iPlayer. And they can get the texts of both your, your plays. Yeah. Is there a website? Or... Um, so Pot is on Oberon. And Diary of a Hounslow Girl is through Aurora Metro. Hi. 
how lovely is it to speak to someone who's not only a great playwright, not only a great actor, not only a very funny sitcom writer, but also someone who's going to be the head of the Queen Vic and the Prime Minister. I, I mean, if that's not multi-talented, I don't know what is, to be honest. If you enjoyed this episode, then we'd really love you to subscribe. It would mean a lot to us, and it'd really help the podcast out. We're still, we're still like a little baby podcast, finding our feet. We've, we've still only got one sock on, and the other sock's fallen off because we're still, you know, growing and learning and making mistakes. But I'm really proud of this. I think we're making something really nice here, and I'd love people to hear it. And if you enjoyed this episode, there'll be more like it. We've got them in the can. We've recorded them. They're on the way. And if you want to help us spread the word and share it to your friends or leave a review on iTunes or anything like that, then it'd mean the world. Thank you very much for your time. Have a lovely week. Look after yourselves. It's a very busy time of year. Everyone's getting very stressful and worried, but it's all right. We're all like that. Just make sure you make sure you take the time to sit down, relax, put your feet up, have a cup of tea, and just have some time to yourself. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe watching a brand new sitcom on iPlayer that's 20 minutes long. Just a recommendation. Thanks very much for listening. We are The 18% and we'll see you again next week. This was The 18% Podcast. It was hosted by Tom Mayhew and produced by Olivia Phipps. All music was provided by Swinging for Mars. Yeah, yeah.